I love hearing the kids tell me that story. And I'm grateful that so many have seen it. <laughs> and I, I did bring my child just in case. He was about to tell the whole story. You could see his hand way up high. So when I was about six years old, I had my first confession. I was raised Catholic, if you didn't know. I can see some nods from other former Catholics in the room. And I was raised on the idea of good and evil. At six years old, apparently, I had committed enough sins <laughs> to warrant a visit to the priest. <sighs> whatever evil I had done, whatever I had committed, sins I had committed as a first grader, it was enough to keep me from heaven. And heaven was more than just eternal happiness. Heaven was where my grandfathers were, my great-grandparents, and someday my parents, my brother, my aunts, uncles, cousins. To be kept out of heaven sounded awful. And in the Catholic Church, as some of you know, when you are kept out of heaven but not quite bad enough to go to hell, you are in an in-between place called purgatory. In my imagination, purgatory was like being locked out of the most amazing party. And everyone you loved was there, and you weren't allowed to go. I was not about to let this happen to me. <laughs> so I did everything I could do as a six-year-old to make sure that I would go straight to heaven. Following the Ten Commandments, of course, that was a big one. Wearing a scapular, I don't know if you know what one of those are, but it's two cloth pictures of Jesus and Mary tied together by a string, and you wear it tucked under your shirt, and you wear it all the time. And it's like a constant prayer, uh, and most of the time a devotion to a saint. And so if you die while you're wearing it, that saint will speak on your behalf and make sure that you go straight to heaven. I also prayed sometimes in the morning, usually before meals, and always at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray to the Lord my soul to take. If I should die before I wake. As a child, I assumed, since I was taught this prayer by adults who seemed to know how the world worked, that this meant that people were probably dying in their sleep all the time without any warning. <laughs> That's pretty scary stuff. So I was thrilled when at six years old I got to go to confession. This was gonna be it for me. For the last six years I had accumul accumulated sins too numerous to really even remember. So I chose to go with some easy ones. Fighting with my brother, not doing what I was told by my parents and teachers, being mean to the other kids, sneaking candy and soda. I knew that once I confessed, the slate would be wiped clean and I was never gonna sin again. I was going to be good. I was in Catholic school at the time and my whole class got to go together, and so we went, led by Sister Marietta, who was about four feet tall, to the church next door, and then we each, one by one, stepped inside what looked like a large wooden box with two sides separated by a blue curtain. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. There was a priest sitting there, and so I did my best to recount my moral failings. The priest replied that I was forgiven, instructed me on the prayers to say in penance, and then told me to let the next person in. <laughs> Just like that. I remember my friends and I afterwards, we felt so light and free that we stretched our arms out and flew like this to the parking lot back to school. 
And in my memory, when I think about it, I am almost actually flying. This is, you know, if goodness had a feeling, this is what it would feel like. Flying, as the poem says, like a wild goose through the sky. Many years later, when I read that Mary Oliver poem, I had already figured out that I was a perpetual sinner. Goodness, it seemed, was beyond me. And heaven, well, I wasn't sure that it really existed at all. But think of what she says in the poem. You do not have to be good. You do not have to be good. This is universalism. In our faith, we don't have to confess. Divine love means that no matter what you do, good or evil, in the end, we are all reconciled to the sacred. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. I think one of the most beautiful things about Unitarian Universalism is that this sort of acceptance of ourselves, of our bodies, of who and what we love, this is taught to our children. What the story that I told them today was not unfamiliar. When I said that they were loved by everybody in this room, that to them is kind of a given, which is amazing if you think about it. They grow up understanding this. There is no God in the sky judging us, hovering in the clouds, looking for reasons to condemn us or separate us from those that we love. We are allowed to love who and what we love and nothing that is love can be evil. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. In Mary Oliver's poem, even despair can be holy. Even despair is sacred. Even at your lowest, you are never kept out of the circle. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes. Over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. And I love this line because even being lonely can sometimes feel like a failure. If we were good, we wouldn't be lonely. If we were good, we would have more friends, we'd go to more parties. But we don't have to be perfect. We only have to love what we love. That is enough, even in our loneliness, even in our despair. We only have to love. You do not have to be good to feel free enough to fly through the parking lot like a wild goose. You do not need anyone to absolve you. We, in all our flaws and imperfections, loving who and what we love, no matter what the world thinks, the poem says the world goes on. In Judeo-Christianity, this is called grace. That this love is available to us at any moment. And it doesn't matter what we do or don't do. As our first principle states, we are inherently worthy. But as you have probably experienced yourself, 
something interesting happens when deep down you truly feel inherently worthy. Out of that place, your sense of self-worth, your understanding that you matter, that you are loved, out of that sense of connection to that great web of life, springs a desire to do good. When you feel good deep down inside and know you are loved, you naturally, instinctively want to share it. When you feel connected, you want to do good. When you have a community like this that supports you, you want to do good. This is not what I was taught growing up. I was taught that you have to do good to be worthy. But now as a UU, I believe that when we as humans are allowed, permitted, invited to connect with that source of love and goodness inside, we feel empowered to do good things for others. We feel inspired to do good things for the world. And as Mary Oliver says, we do not have to walk on our knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. We only have to connect with love. And then we don't worry so much about being good. Instead, we start looking for ways that we can do good. The world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So now I have a confession for you. I never actually said the prayers the priest told me to say that day. <laughs> Gasps <laughs> and applause. <laughs> I mean, I tried, but I was six. And I could only kind of remember half of one, and the other one was boring, and I didn't want to say it 10 times. So I sort of just pretended I said the prayers. So you see, I had barely stepped out the door when I was beset with sin again. <laughs> but it was too late, because the world had offered itself to my imagination. And I flew through that parking lot with my friends, feeling loved and forgiven. And perhaps I wouldn't be good, but eventually I would figure out how to do good. And that became much more meaningful. We belong here, each one of us, in this beautiful church, in Shoreline, in this community, but also in the world, on this earth, doing what we're doing, bringing what it is that we bring. No matter what anyone has told us about our failings and mistakes, no matter what we've been told about goodness and perfection, we belong here and we are enough. We are inherently worthy of all the world has to offer. And we have every right, whether we say our prayers or not, to live from that love that rests deep within us and to respond to the world with all that we are as it announces our place in the family of things.